Uh, this is my friend Don. Uh, he's been out here taking the bark off of this. I've got this saw that I want to test uh, on the log. It's a good idea to always test a saw before you take it out in the woods because you never know for sure how it's been treated in the past or in fact if it's, uh, if it's been well filed. So uh, what we're, what's going on here is that uh, Don's already taken most of the bark off of here but the, uh, not all of it yet. And the reason I want to take the bark off of this particular log is that you can see there's a lot of dirt on here. This was skidded through the woods. You know, it takes quite a while to sharpen one of these things up and you want to make sure that, the, that you don't have any dirt that can get into the, into the teeth and dull them. So we can go ahead and finish taking the, okay. taking the bark off of there and then we'll give this thing a spin and see what happens. Okay, ready? Okay. Go ahead. It looks like it's throwing some pretty good shavings, Don. Oh, yeah, these are nice. Looks like noodles. You can tell an awful lot about how a saw is cutting by looking at the nature of the shavings. If they're long and they don't have whiskers on the sides, then your saw is cutting pretty well. Oh, I don't yeah. feel any catches in it, no. so I don't think there's any rakers that are particularly high. Uh, so let's... Now these look really clean. Yeah, let's put this all off to the side here. And uh, actually, when you're, when you're putting a saw down someplace, it's a good idea to uh, put it down with a saw pointing into something like a log here. So I'll just set the saw that way. And now we can look at these shavings and make a critique of the shavings and see what they look like here. Uh, we've got a pretty good pile of of uh, pretty long shavings. We don't have very much in the way of, of small small pieces which means that the saw uh, is generally running well. If you have uh, sawdust coming out of there that's got a lot of this really small stuff, uh, it, it uh, means that the saw is somehow out of adjustment. Either the rakers are really really short or perhaps a, um, a cutter is well they are pulling shavings off the side of the curve. Now, looking at an individual shaving here, uh, we can learn quite a bit, is, is whether or not they're clean on the sides or whether they have whiskers. Now this particular shaving uh, has a few whiskers on one side, uh, none on the other, so that's, that's a pretty good sign. If you have a little bit of whisker, uh, it actually means that your raker is doing the work of taking all of the wood out that the, the cutters have, uh, have severed. Now if you end up with a, a uh, shaving that looks like this that has pretty substantial whiskers on, on one or both sides, it indicates that you have a little bit of a long raker and that could be because you actually overfiled uh, one of the cutter teeth. That will, that will cause a situation like that. If you have shavings that are like this, that are nice and long, but they're very thin, that indicates that your rakers are probably a little bit too short. And uh, to, to get good effective saw operation, you need to have your rakers a little bit longer so that you do end up pulling just, just a hint of, of whiskers on the side of your shaving. You tell a lot about a saw by the, by the type of shavings that you get out of it. After the teeth are filed up to a point, the next step is setting. And before I actually do the setting process, what I do is to take a small stone, a carborundum stone like this, 
and go over the back sides of the teeth uh, carefully to take off any burrs that were developed by the filing process. So the setting process is the uh, process of bending each tooth a little bit out away from the uh, from the plane of the saw. Okay, the three tools that I use for setting are a spider, uh, which has four legs, and one of the legs on the spider is slightly shorter than the other three legs. The second tool I use is an anvil, uh, which I use to back my hammer up, and I strike the tooth with a hammer and bend it over the, uh, bend it over the anvil. First step, put the spider on the, on the saw, run it across, if it touches the tooth, you know you've got too much set in it. If it doesn't touch the tooth, then you know that there's either just enough or not quite enough. When I'm doing this, when I'm actually setting, it's a good idea to actually put a piece of leather or some other protection on the saw under your arm, uh, under your arm area so that there's no chance of, of uh, getting yourself cut with the teeth. I actually lean up against the saw like this when I'm doing the setting. So I'll put the spider on there, move across there. This particular tooth, I'm feeling no resistance, so I know that that tooth probably needs a little bit of set in it. So I put the tip of the, of the spider right on the tip of the tooth, and I rock it back and forth this way. If I get a little bit of rocking, then I know that I need to put some more set in it. The tooth needs very little set. You actually probably won't be able to even see that spider moving back and forth. It's entirely done by feel. This particular tooth, I can see a little bit of motion and I can feel that it's ticking on the tooth. So what I do when I'm using, when I'm using these three tools, I try not to put them down. Uh, because there's a lot of back and forth motion. If you have to put one of your tools down, you lose quite a bit of time. So what I do, I measure the, measure the set, I palm the spider, switch sides for the anvil, put the anvil about a quarter of an inch below the tip of the tooth, and then strike the tooth with the hammer slightly above the, the bevel that's on the anvil so that it bends the tooth over that bevel and I strike the, t the tooth probably at a, at a 30 degree angle or something like that rather than, rather than directly at the tooth. I come down on the tooth at a slight angle. And I find that it helps a lot when I'm setting for accuracy rather than move my hammer from the elbow is I actually move my hammer from the wrist and give it kind of a snap action. It makes me a lot more accurate than moving it from my elbow. So when I'm putting set in, I just give it a couple licks, swap the anvil, get my spider out, and check the tooth. Well, I put too much set in at that time. It's actually hitting the uh, this tip of the spider. So now I need to take some set out of that tooth uh, for it to be correct. To take set out of the tooth, rather than having the anvil a quarter inch below the tip of the tooth, I move it up to where it's almost to the tip. And then what I do is to move the bottom of the anvil away from the saw a little bit to give bending room uh, to take the set out. And I move the hammer down the tooth a little bit to put a reverse uh, bend or, or torque on that tooth. So I give it a light stroke and test it again. Still got too much. And what I was doing there to figure out whether it had too much, I ran the, the the spider across the tip, I feel it hitting, and then what I'll often do to measure how much too much is in it, I'll put the tip right on the tip of the tooth, and then with these two fingers that are on the spider, I'll try rocking it this way around these two points and, and get an idea how much too much sets in it. So I'm rocking it back and forth around the two end legs, and then to take the set out, some more set out, I just move the anvil pretty close to the tip of the tooth like that and strike it lightly. 
and check it again. And it's still just a skosh too much. Okay, and that's that's the basic process to to setting a saw. Okay, once I've got all the rakers swedged and finished up and fitted, uh, the next step in the process is filing up the cutting teeth. And to do that, I tilt the vise so that I get good light on the bright spots that were generated by the jointer, and it also sets me up in a, a good position for getting a good angle on the, on the bevel of the teeth. I'll just start filing down here at the left end of the saw. And I'll point up the cutter teeth that are facing me, because you got, of course, you got cutter teeth that are facing both ways, so I'll be filing every other cutter tooth. The file that I'm using to do this is what's called an 8 inch mill bastard. And what that means is that the, the shape of the blank, or the shape of the file itself, is a mill shape. That is, it has, it has a slight taper towards the ends of it. And the bastard refers to the actual coarseness of the cut. It's not the finest nor the coarsest cut that uh, files have, and it's, it, it uh, is a good, adequate coarseness that takes metal off fairly rapidly, but it's not so coarse that it leaves a, a really rough surface on the tooth. When you're filing a tooth that you have to take a lot of material off, you'll find that you'll have a little burr on the back side of the tooth that you have to periodically remove. And I do it with a file. I just do a rolling action on it, roll the, that burr onto the back side of the tooth, and then cut it off with the file. If you don't take that burr off of there, you'll find that you'll be tricked that the tooth has a different shape than it actually has because the burr will stick out and uh, lead you to think that the, that the tooth is actually wider than it actually is. This is a close-up example of the process for actually filing a cutter tooth. And this will illustrate both the shape of the cutter tooth that uh, I want to achieve, and also how I file up to and just almost make the bright spot, which is on the tip of this tooth, disappear. So what I'll do, I'll start filing down here towards the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, shoulder of the tooth and work up towards the tip. So as I put my file on here, you'll be able to see the bright spot where my file is, is first hitting. Now it's important when you're filing to not watch the file. You need to watch your work because uh, it's only by watching your work and ignoring the, the file with your eyes that you can actually observe the progression of the file strokes as you go up the tip. So you can see the first stroke is down here towards the bottom. I'm working that shape up towards the tip of that tooth. Now I'm actually touching the tip right now with the, the bright spots gone clear up to the tip, uh, but I've got a pretty good flat spot on there. And my intention is to file on this side of the tooth until about half of this bright spot disappears. And then I'll switch sides and start filing on the other side and make the other half of that flat spot disappear. I have a little bit more work to do on this side. Observe here how I move the file off to the side on the return stroke so I can see where metal was removed. And I should have about half of that flat spot or the bright spot disappear. Now I also want to take the burr off of this because there's a little bit of a burr been generated on the back side of that. So I do that with my file. 
just knock the knock the burr off like that. So I now have a true picture of what that what the shape of that tooth is. Now <clears throat> I'll start on the other side of the, the tooth. And I'm start you'll you'll see I'm starting to take metal off of right down here. And as I said before, I'm not watching my file at all. I'm actually watching where the file is hitting, watching the progress of that file and the file marks as it progresses up towards the tip of the tooth. Okay, now I've actually hit the, I've taken all the rust off, and so I'm actually beginning to work on the, the very tip of that tooth. I have a little bit of a burr on the back side of that, which is a good idea to remove. And so you can see the bright spot's still there. Uh, as, as I continue filing, that bright spot will get smaller and smaller. To where on that last stroke, the bright spot should have just disappeared. Now I'll take off the burr. And now we have a, a tooth that's pointed out. Okay, once we've shaped our raker tips to where they're thin enough to swedge, now we have to go into the swedging process. Our objective when we're swedging a raker is to uh, bend that wedge of metal. We got a good clean, say a 20 to 30 degree angle wedge of metal here. And we'll first hit the tip of it right up here with the hammer and it bends it over a little bit. Now we have a little bit of a shoulder here and the next blow of the hammer will be on the shoulder of the, uh, that we've just created and bend it over a little bit more. And so each successive strike of the hammer will bend that tip over more and more and shape a uniform, even curve on the bottom side of the raker tip or the, or the leading edge of the raker tip so that when, the, when it, the shaving comes along, it'll be lifted evenly and uniformly off of the bottom of the curve. To swedge the saw, what I use is something called a pin gauge. Where the pin gauge is just a tool that you place on the saw like this and there's this pin in it or a screw in this case that sticks down slightly below a plate that rests on top of your cutter teeth. I use the pin gauge and a one pound swedging hammer and to do that what I normally do is put the pin gauge on the, on the uh, saw go back and forth across that particular tooth and see if the raker tip is higher than the pin. Well, here it is, definitely. You can hear it, you can feel it hitting the, uh, the tip of that raker. So now what I'm going to do is strike that raker tip with the hammer. A few times, get a bend started, measure it. It's still too high. So I, I'll continue uh, striking that, the, the tip over and measuring it with the pin gauge until the pin gauge just barely touches it. Okay, now this particular raker is being a little bit difficult to, to, uh, to swedge over. And so what I'll do is thin this up just a little bit more. There's a shoulder right here, the interface between where the hammer's been hitting it and where I had filed it. And I'll take just a little bit of metal off of that. Take a couple licks off of that. One more should do it.
Okay. And what I've done is I've hammered it over to where the pin gauge barely touches that raker tip. Now that I've finished uh, swedging the raker over to the pin, uh, I need to dress the bottom side of these, the raker tip because we're talking about sharpened chisel edges here. And what I've been doing is, sh is beating on a sharpened chisel edge with a hammer, which is contrary to making a, an edge sharp. So there's a good chance that I've perhaps uh, knocked one corner over a little bit more than the other, or got a little bit of a burr on the bottom side of that, uh, that raker tip. So I'll take a slim taper file like this. This is a, I think a six inch file that I have ground the corners on it safe. That is, I've taken either an ax stone or a grinding wheel and I've made it so the corners on this file will not cut metal. So they're, they're basically smooth. And I'll take that file and I'll put it on the bottom side of that raker tip that I've swedged, adjust the angle on that file so that it matches the angle uh, of the swedge and carefully, fairly lightly, file across that tip to dress it up. Take any burrs, any unevennesses, uh, et cetera, off, of that, off the bottom side of that tooth. And I do that with every left hand raker tip on this side of the saw. So now that I've got a raker tip that has been swedged to height, I've dressed the bottom of it, I still have the top of it which is been swedged to the pin, but that's not my final raker height. See, I set the pin up on the, uh, on the pin gauge so that the raker tip is still about three thousandths of an inch too high after I've swedged it. So now I need to take that three thousandths off uh, and in the process, I dress the top of that raker. And I do that using a tool called a raker gauge, which has a flat filing plate on it that is adjusted so that when I put it over the saw like this and run over the top of it over this filing plate, or the file, it dresses the tip of that raker down to the final height that I want it. So the process is making sure that the, the filing plate is up against the edge of the tooth, put the file on it, and just take off that little teeny bit of raker tip that was sticking up above the plate. And depending on what the height of my raker gauge is, this particular raker gauge for this particular saw is set up at 12 thousandths of an inch uh, below the, uh, the line between these two cutter teeth. Once I get that height uh, to, you know, once I get that the proper height, on this tooth, on this raker tip, and all the rest of them, this raker tip, the raker tips on the left hand side are now finished. They're complete. Uh, and they'll all have uh, machined bottom surfaces, machined top surfaces, and all be precisely the same height. So, next, what I will do to uh, complete this process is to turn the saw around. And then I'll continue doing the, uh, the opposite raker tip. Okay, this, this saw is filing quite easily, which implies to me that the rakers are not extremely hard. However, you'll occasionally run into saws that have quite hard rakers and the result of a hard raker is that the steel is enough more brittle that when you swedge it, there's a good chance of breaking off the raker tips. 
if I have a saw that's filing very hard uh, so that after just a few strokes my file starts slipping or if I find that with a new file I'm starting to wipe the, uh, the teeth off of the file then that's a red flag that this saw is probably pretty hard and I will need to heat treat it. Uh, another red flag is <coughs> if after you've filed the teeth and you break a raker tip off then that is pretty much of a, a red flag which just says you need to heat treat your, your rakers. When you're using the torch for uh, heating your rakers like this, you have to be aware of what part of the flame you're using because if you hold the, this part of the flame here that's got the bright blue color to it, uh, that's an oxygen deficient part of the flame and it won't let your colors develop. So you have to hold the flame on the torch or on the tooth uh, to where it's outside of that uh, bright blue part of the flame and even then as you watch the colors run you occasionally have to move the torch off to the side of the tooth in order to truly watch the colors run. So I'll go ahead and I'll start heating at the bottom of the, the tooth here. You'll, you'll see the colors turn. The, it first starts with a kind of a straw color and then it turns brown and then a purple color and then a, a real dark blue and a light blue it goes through a turquoise color and then it, it'll uh, go through that series again but much less intense. So I'm starting to heat right at the bottom of the tooth. You can see where the, where the torch is, is hitting the tooth and what I'm doing is moving the, the uh, flame off to the side as you're watching the, t the colors go up the tooth. Okay you can see the, the colors are starting to turn there. They're starting to turn. You can just see the a, a brown that's turning now it's turning purple and, and sort of turning blue and I'll just follow that color right up towards the tip. Okay so that's that tooth is now done. You got to be careful when you're doing this that you don't actually uh, overheat the tips of the of the rakers because they're fine and they can overheat quite rapidly but you can see the color sequence on that. <coughs> 